What do you guys think of the new set? We're actually just in a green screen stage right now. Jeez, it's like we're really there. It seems like it. What should we edit back there? I mean, we could edit anything. I guess like, I think there should be a lake over there. Yeah, or like a mountain somewhere there. Or yeah, some yeah, mountains. I don't know, like... By the way, every time you take the camera out for a walk, I would recommend checking for potato. I remember you came up with an acronym once. You know how in kids shows they sing a song and yeah, they're like, yeah. remember to do this, yeah. <laughs> P stands for power. O stands for optics. So check your lenses and ND filters. Okay. T stands for tape, even though we don't use tape anymore. It's SD cards, or you can also do transfer. So, so far we have pot. Okay, we got pot. A for audio, right? You need your audio. And then another T for tripods. And I always check for tripods plates. And the last O is for on screen. So whatever you're gonna be filming, you gotta spend a, a second to think about it. Now Dylan's gonna convert this into a song so it's easier to remember. Ready? Kay. And hit it, Dylan. P e is for power, O is for optics, T is for tape, even though there's not tape. A is for audio, T is for uh, tripod, and O is for on screen, and now your camera works. Any musicians out there, can you take that recording and make it like a it? hard ass song? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, a rap version? Yeah. Sony FX30, Canon R7. Really exciting because of the amount of features that they bring to the sub $2,000 category for video. Let's pull up some split screen footage. And these are both what I call the out of the box point and shoot settings. So there is no color grading and actually everything is on auto, including the exposure. The only thing I did was change the frame rates and resolution to 4K 24 frames per second. So unmanipulated settings here. Exactly. Which one do you like better? Well, right off the bat, the colors look brighter and more vibrant on the right. But in this shot, my skin tone looks more red versus the one on the left. Your hair color looks different. Mm-hmm, yeah, it looks more red. I like the idea of not having to mess with any color stuff. Like, I don't wanna color grade. I'm not ready for that yet. The only downside is it looks like the skin tones. Like, my skin tones look a lot more pink or red versus the one on the left. So, yeah, I don't know why, but I think if I had to choose between the two, I would go for the right, despite the skin tone thing. I suspect that the one that I like is the Canon because Canon has a reputation for their color. So you are right. Ding, ding, ding. On the Sony, we're looking at something called S-Cinetone, which is designed to look pretty good. So if you need to go straight out of camera into a delivery, generally looks good, but it's still definitely way less contrasty and saturated. But one of the things about contrast and saturation is that it's way easier to add than subtract. Okay. So here's a couple of color grades I did where I just added a few basic oh. things, contrast, saturation, and maybe a slight adjustment on exposure. And that will just give me a little bit more of a match in terms yeah, of Yeah, they look the very look. similar. Do you still prefer the one on the right? If I can help it, I don't want that extra hassle of having to go in and try to like change It's things. three clicks, it's <laughs> contrast, saturation, and maybe, so they're most likely just two clicks. I did not spend more than 10 seconds on any of these grades. Just saying. <laughs> All right, now let's look at some stabilization. The right looks way more stabilized. Is that your final answer? Yes, look at it. <laughs> okay, yeah. It's definitely <laughs> Like this is night one that's very difference. clear. And these two cameras are fixed together, so they are shaking the same amount. There's three forms of stabilization. There's stabilization in the sensor, which is called IBIS, in-body image stabilization. The Canon's IBIS is really good, even if you don't have image stabilization in the lens. This is purely IBIS. The downside of have an IBIS so strong is that when you go into a wide angle, you get the IBIS wobble. Whoa. Oh. This is on a 10 mil. You see that? That's so strange. And it makes sense because the whole sensor is actually shifting around. Mm -hmm. The ideal IBIS would be fairly stiff on the wide end. And then as you tighten in the lens, it'll detect it and then like stabilize it more. Mm -hmm. But right now we're either dealing with a really strong IBIS or a IBIS that doesn't do as much. Now, when it comes to the digital image stabilization, the Sony stabilizes it digitally, referencing the gyro data. Canon on the other hand, looks at the image and tries to stabilize it. Here's oh, I can see it. I can see it going like this. It almost right. looks like someone's hand holding it. Right. But but the camera's on a tripod. It's tracking the subject because it's analyzing oh. the image. I mean, but if you have pretty decent IBIS in the camera, then you shouldn't need the digital stabilization as much. Yeah, I wouldn't really turn it on. By default, it has IBIS turned on, but no digital image stabilization. And when it comes to the lenses for the optical image stabilization, Canon has a lot of optical stabilized lenses. There's not that many Sony lenses that are optically stabilized. So generally speaking, if you want a stable shot out of a Sony, you put it on a gimbal or a tripod or a zip line or on a camel that's on a scooter. Camel might be the worst. They oh, like just, run. This just came like... to my head. It's on a scooter though, okay? 
I recovered when I said it was on a scooter. Huge shout out to PGY Tech for sponsoring this episode. I made a video about this Mantis pod a while back and this is the new 2.0. Seriously, one of my favorite things that just literally never leave my camera bag. I mean, it's great to have it as like a vlog handle, but of course it swings out and turns into a little tripod. One of the biggest things I like about this new version is that it has a wider natural footprint. So it's just more stable. This little button here is to get into super low mode. It's the bigger button to adjust the angle so you can hit that with your thumb so you can adjust your vlog angle it locks in just like that but it's also less expensive so that yeah and my favorite feature is that hook right here so you can rig it in spots like this or a sign like this or even your favorite trash can or i guess you could just put it up here and just normal like that but it is seriously nice because if you don't want to be in vlog mode you can set it up as a tripod and you don't have to be ground level you could generally find something that you can hook this thing on so just like before we have a cold shoe so we can slide our microphone in like that but i love that it swivels so you can rotate it back and get your own audio arca swiss mount which is awesome almost all my cameras have arca swiss mounts on here all the time and this little lever right here that's very important so you don't accidentally bump it and your camera can't just fall off I've had that happen before with one of my older tripods, was not fun. Underneath the hook is storage for an optional phone holder right here, but this just locks in like that. Toss your phone in and now you have a phone tripod as well. There is an optional slot right here where you can put in a Bluetooth controller. I mean, I think this thing pretty much speaks for itself. It's a really well thought out design, but Mantis Pod 2.0, perfect for cameras this size, like the R7 or FX30. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a closer look at the camera bodies themselves. So Carrie, I'm actually gonna give you you this camera to record the FX30. So we'll switch to this. And I'm also swapping out the lens. So this is the Sigma 18 to 35 F18 zoom lens. So Carrie, you could actually zoom the lens and still maintain an F18. Lenses designed for smaller sensors tend to be able to pack in more performance. So zoom lens at an F18 all the way through, really cool option. Notice we have a full size HDMI right there. Now, when I plug in the HDMI here, notice that this screen shuts off and it comes to here. The menu, you see how it says external setup i believe hdmi info display you turn that off and now you get a clean feed here but you also get to see down here and you can hit record and use this as an external monitor or send it out to like a wireless video transmitter when it comes to audio we have our 3.5 mil mic input as well as headphone jack but this is an optional top handle so you can power a lot of professional microphones off of this and go straight onto the camera and what's nice is that there's two channels here but there's also the stereo two channels from this mic input so you can actually record four channels of audio in one file. Speaking of professional features, this is a time code adapter. And now this camera is receiving the time code from this tentacle sync. You know how you have to go around going like, to sync the audio and video and all the different cameras. This will just do it all for you. So you can hit record and cut a bunch of different times with a bunch of different cameras and a bunch of different microphones. And in post, you can just line up a thousand clips like that. Time code is something that my a7 IV doesn't even have. What the f Canon R7 seems like a much different type of camera. And we're switched over. So now this is how the Sony is set up. Taking a close look at the Canon, it honestly feels really good in the hands. But once we try to expand it out, first of all, micro HDMI and when we plug it in for a view on the external monitor we do lose feed on this monitor here I'm recording you guys right now do you know that that's how you look this is how you look to me the part that kind of sucks is that from what I understand you cannot have a video feed both going out through HDMI as well as the camera unless you plan on recording externally with something like an Atomos but what it does have is a viewfinder and it does feel like a camera that's really nice to take pictures with so I would think that this is a photo first camera and the FX30 is a video first camera. All right, so now we're at Temecula. It's basically like where you come and just be fancy and drink wine. But here's a little split screen with both cameras and log so we can see how much dynamic range we can get out of these cameras. Here. I don't think that's what you're supposed to ah, do. That was some exquisite wine. Uh, now I'm gonna be plastered for half this video. It all starts off looking boring and flat and then I'm gonna convert it over to Rec 709. This is a good example because the background is really bright, right? And we're here in the shady balcony. So a camera with a lot of dynamic range will be able to have a lot of detail in us as well as detail out there where it's bright. It's a big part of why I'm a big fan of 10-bit because with 10-bit color, you can hold so much more information across a wider width. So I think like the Canon, it will automatically hop into 10-bit if it's in log, 
or 8-bit if it's not unlocked, which is kind of nice because it's just kind of doing this stuff for you. So let's look at a few more shots where we shot it in log and then converted it over to Rec. 709, which is basically this colorful final image that we're looking at now. Now the Sony is S-Log3, which is the flattest log profile. And again, the only reason why I'm using the S-Log3 is because we have 10-bit. If we only had 8-bit, I would not have it on this mode because there's just not enough data to support that dynamic range. The Canon is also on log, but it's on C-Log3. Now here's the thing that could get a little bit confusing. On Sony, S-Log3 is the flattest color profile, so you get the most dynamic range, the most greatest ability, the flexibility and all that. Three. Now on Canon, C-Log2 actually has the most. C-Log3 is supposed to be easier to grade, but it actually doesn't have as much dynamic range as C-Log2. So on the R7, they actually don't include C-Log2 because it's complicated to grade. So again, Sony gives us all the options. Canon gives us what they think is gonna be the best and make things the easiest for everybody. But regardless, they both have really good dynamic range. This is definitely how I would suggest everyone shoot with these cameras if they have 10 bit and then just convert it over that way if you decide to tweak it or you get your exposure wrong or whatever you have so much more flexibility now the importance of having dynamic range is sometimes you don't have great even lighting you have some bright spots and dark spots in the shot but one of the things i like to do is just intentionally way under expose the shot and then just recover it so i can see what is going down there in the shadows and i could also go the other way where we go and see what's up there in the highlights so if we blow it out and then we recover it notice that we actually do have more highlight information with the Sony, which is something I like. But again, this is just at the very edges of the sensor's exposure range. Before the price point, the amount of color information and dynamic range that both of these cameras give you, it's pretty insane. The Sony does have an edge in terms of the dynamic range, but earlier when you were filming me with both cameras, I actually preferred the way the Canon look even after we did the Rec. 709 conversion. I actually generally find the Canon's look to just be a little bit more pleasing. The FX30 has a dual native ISO, which is an advantage in low light because once you get to a certain ISO, it hops into that higher base. Now the R7 does not, but there is a noise reduction on high ISO options. So right now it's on standard. I've been drinking too much wine, guys, in case you couldn't notice. We're here, we, we, we finished our bottle and now we're here trying to make our own wine. Hey, have you seen the video of the lady that's like stepping on the... Oh, oh she got the wind knocked out of her. <laughs> No, I know, because you taped me crashing on the mountain bike. Now we're at ISO 12,800. Whoa. How's it look? We're at like F8, so I could bring up the exposure with the lens, which would be ideal. Like this dance room? It's always better. Yes, that's Ugh. beautiful. Oh my. I think every camera that I test out from now on, I have to fly it. I mean, just give it a little bit of speed real quick. So we're going about 80 kilometers an hour right now. So I'm flying an 11 mil prime on here right now. Hi, Carrie. And I actually turned off all image stabilization. And what's nice about doing that with a Sony is that it actually records the gyro data into the file. So you can use Catalyst Browse to stabilize it in post. It's kind of like Sony's version of Real Steady. I don't think it's just good, but I mean, it'd be kind of interesting to see if I can stabilize this footage. It's recording at 24 frames per second, but my shutter speed to 100th of a second to try to get each frame to be just a little bit crispier so that I can stabilize it a little bit better. I'm curious about how the results look when it's completely unstabilized and stabilized. I mean like an ideal drone camera would have no IBIS because IBIS can jitter around in there apparently. Should I go through the window? No. <laughs> <laughs> but overall the weight is not bad so possible as a drone camera? Maybe. Let's try the R7. Let's see what kind of speed I can get here. 85, 90 kilometers an hour here. Oh man, I gotta say, I'm so spoiled by the O3 air unit now, the new uh, digital FPV system. Right now I'm flying the older DJI air unit and when it comes to seeing branches and stuff, it's night and day difference for sure. A good example are these branches right here. If I didn't know this park, I would totally not see those until the last second. There's just not much contrast. <laughs> okay, I'm confident I'm not gonna crash but it still gets my heart rate up for sure. Well, actually I can see my heart rate. I've got one more battery left, which is kind of dangerous to say last pack because that's usually where people crash. But I kind of want to try it out with IBIS as well as digital image stabilization turned on. When you have stabilization like this working with you, a lot of times the direction changes kind of throw you off. So let's say if I go this way, 
I swing back this way to the left. How's that look? Does it look all jarring? Stabilization out of the R7, I feel like is pretty good when it works, but sometimes when you do certain maneuvers or some aggressive turns, it gets a little confused. But both cameras, I think, do pretty good on the FPV drone, even though they both have IBIS. And generally speaking, you don't want IBIS in a drone camera because they can wobble around in there. But considering that they both have IBIS, I think they both look pretty good. When you're recording at really high speeds like this, there's a lot changing in the frame. So it's a lot of data for the camera to have to keep up with. Now, one thing I noticed about the autofocus in video is that the Sony's just feels more locked on these days. The Canon R7, it's pretty good most of the time, but once in a while, it does seem to slip away even if I'm using Canon RF lenses. Like right now, in this close up, I'm using Sony autofocus and I trust it. This is a Canon. Once in a while, I feel like I'll have a little drift out. But of course, that's video autofocus and in photo autofocus has been good in all cameras for a pretty long time. The Canon sensor actually does have more megapixels. Now they are both smaller sensors and that's part of the reason why they're more on a budget than their full frame counterparts. So APS-C or Super 35, however you want to call it, but basically you're going to want to make sure that you understand that when you're picking out lenses, you want to go for something wider because it is cropped in. If this has a crop factor of 1.5x, a 10 millimeter lens on here becomes a... Oh, what, 10 times 1.5? Which is? 15. <laughs> Ding, 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 Dylan, you get zero points. It's a lot of math. We're gonna push you into this green screen and you're gonna roll down. Well, the Canon actually does take the whole image and down samples it when you have it on the 4K fine setting. And that does cap out at 4K 30 frames per second. Now, if you wanna just do regular 4K, you can get it up to 60 frames per second. And that is one of the nice things about the Canon is the menu system just seems to be a little bit more in plain English. Opposed to the Sony, if you've never used a Sony camera before, you might be like, what? setting do I put it on to record? But what's nice is once you figure it out, you can really fine tune the settings. So for example, in H.265 4K, you're still getting that big resolution, but you could decide how much data rate to give it. So 100 is pretty default. 50 actually I am shooting on right now, but on the FX30, you could get down to 30. That means you could still be recording 4K. And as long as there's not too much action moving around in the frame, it's still gonna look pretty good. And the file sizes are gonna be tiny, which is 30 megabits per second opposed to the canon where it doesn't really give you those options it just says hey here's a good one but like times like this where i want to roll multiple cameras i can end up recording three cameras and have the same amount of data as one camera of course there's limitations to that smaller bit rate but you know you can kind of fine tune things what sounds better to you guys a simpler menu or a more complicated one but with more control simple yeah and it can get very overwhelming if you dive in headfirst into like an FX30. But one thing Sony has done is implemented this video menu where you see a lot of the pro video features you want to see at a glance. So you can kind of check all the must see settings all at once. And of course there still is the price difference. So it's 300 bucks that you can put towards a lens. Yeah, I think ultimately it does come down to just what your needs are. Now, speaking of lenses, it's an RF mount and an E mount. And of course you can use full frame lenses. If you already have a full frame camera and maybe you want one of these as a second camera, you can still use your full frame lenses on these cameras. You don't have to switch and get all new lenses or a whole new system of stuff. Yeah, you could, but usually when you remove the requirement for a lens to have to cover a full frame sensor, then they can make something like this, which is quite a bit smaller or something like this, which we were testing out earlier, the F1.8 all the way through in a zoom lens. You don't really get an F1.8 zoom lens on a full frame. But what I think is really cool about the Canon RF system is that there are adapters to go from RF to EF and there is probably more EF lenses out there than any other type of lens. And what's nice about EF is that it's also Canon. So when you go from a Canon RF to EF, you can get their adapter and it's very seamless. All the autofocus and all the functions work really well. There's no compatibility issues. And by doing that, you could also get a drop in variable ND filter. It's kind of like getting an internal ND filter in here. But what I think is really interesting is that a while back, I got a RF speed booster from Metabones. And at first it wasn't working with this R7, but I just did the latest firmware update. And so far, all the full frame EF lenses I've tested out on here actually work pretty flawlessly. So it's actually amazing because the big reasons why people like to have those full frame sensors is because you get that shallower depth of field, which you get out of the speed booster and also better low light performance, which you also get out of the speed booster. Is this a uh, fake light too bright for you, Dylan? Yeah, you can't move that or anything, dude. <laughs> Sorry, it's too heavy. It's a 10K. I can't really move that thing. You got to ask the grip department. 
who's on a yeah. lunch break right now. Now the Sony FX30 has a built-in fan, so no overheating here, but the Canon R7 can overheat, but it actually lasts pretty long, especially considering that it doesn't have a fan. They just give you a little meter and tells you how much it's overheating at that moment. But if you have a Canon R7, I would definitely make sure that you have the latest firmware on there because when I first did the test, it shut down and the whole file was lost. <gasps> Imagine if you were filming a wedding and that happened. I know, oh right? Dude. Dude. Terrible. Keep your Suck. firmware updated. I did an update on the firmware and after that, it has always been able to keep the file. So let me finish this up by reading a couple of comments. I'd love to hear your take on the Z9. Nikon is really putting it out there. And Nikon is one of the brands that I am kind of curious about testing out. And I also keep hearing that Fujifilm is doing some pretty cool stuff here. So maybe I'll have to check them out. You guys should let me know in the comments which cameras that are the most interesting to you guys. And then you guys should vote and whatever the cameras that are the most upvoted, I'll take a serious look at those. Let me know down there in the comments, we're voting. This is a, a communal thing that we're doing. Regarding the FX30 and R7, if you had to choose one to shoot with forever over the other, which one would you choose and why? I personally would go for the FX30 for two big reasons. I think for me, autofocus is such a high priority. I'm literally using two cameras right now, relying on autofocus and whenever you need a shot and it's out of focus it's like mm, uh, yeah. and the second thing out of there is i love the ibis out of here but that wobble on the wide end is just a bit much for me and the thing is i always use a wide angle lens for vlogging because i'm usually filming like two feet away from my face so between the autofocus and ibis wobble i personally would go for the fx30 but the canon r7 is very effortless to get a really nice looking picture. Just converting the C-Log3 just straight, it just, it looks nice. And don't forget, uh, potato stands for what? P is for power, O is for optics, T is for tape, but not really tape. A is for audio, T is for tripod, and O is for on-screen. Now your camera works. <laughs>